Uh, you know, John MacArthur, uh, in his commentary on the book of Mark, he told this story of a poor blind girl who lived in France. She lived there some years ago. Somehow she had obtained, according to the writer, a gospel of Mark in, in Braille. It was all she had. She read it with tips of her fingers and, and read it and read it and read it until her fingers became very calloused and her sense of touch diminished so that she could no longer distinguish the characters. In an ill-conceived effort to revitalize, if you will, to resensitize her fingers, she cut them at the very ends, which only made them less sensitive. And the writer says she felt that she must now give up her beloved book of Mark. And weeping, she pressed that Bible to her lips, saying, farewell, farewell, sweet word of my Savior. And to her surprise, her lips, more delicate than her fingers, discerned the form of the letters. And so all night she perused with her lips the book of Mark and overflowed with joy at this new acquisition. Isn't that a neat story? Um, I'd like for you, if you would, please, to open your Bibles, if you have not yet done so, to... Mark chapter 8. Mark chapter 8. You may have a written word in front of you, or you may be on an iPhone if you have that app. <clears throat> but if you could get to Mark chapter 8, and we're going to take a look at uh, Mark 11 through 21. Now, you might say, well, wait a minute. We did that last week. Well, we did, but this is part two. Uh, this is part two, and I'll better explain that here in a moment. Uh, today, uh, doing part two of this text on spiritual blindness. On spiritual blindness. First part, last week we looked at spiritual blindness that, that is permanent. A blindness that is permanent. And, and secondly, this week, uh, we're going to look at spiritual blind, uh, blindness, um, which is only temporary. It's only temporary. So let's begin to read in, in Mark chapter 8, or follow along as I read, if you would, uh, verses 11 through 21. The Pharisees came and began to question Jesus, to test him. And they asked him for a sign from heaven. He sighed deeply and said, why does this generation ask for a miraculous sign? I tell you the truth, no sign will be given to it. And then he left them, got back into the boat, and crossed over to the other side. The disciples had forgotten to bring bread, except for one loaf they had with them in the boat. Be careful, Jesus warned them. Watch out for the yeast of the Pharisees and that of Herod. And they discussed this with one another and said, It is because we have no bread. Aware of their discussion, Jesus asked them, Why are you talking about having no bread? Do you still not see or understand? Are your hearts hardened? Do you have eyes but fail to see and ears but fail to hear? And don't you remember... When I broke the five loaves for the 5,000, how many baskets full of pieces did you pick up? Twelve, they replied. And when I broke the seven loaves for the 4,000, how many basket fulls of pieces did you pick up? And they answered, seven. And he said to them, do you still not understand? Won't you bow and pray with me, please? Father God, we thank you for our time uh, here together this morning. Uh, we thank you, Father, for your word, which you have preserved over the years many, many years, and uh, Father, we're so grateful for that because that's how we come to know you, and all that was designed by you, and so Father, we just pray uh, just now that you would open our hearts, open our minds, uh, our ears, that we might hear the word which you have for us this morning, uh, for it's in Christ's name we pray, amen. You know, that story I mentioned was a story that John MacArthur told in his commentary. And I want to tell you that throughout this series, in addition to my uh, many past studies, I've leaned heavily on, on the teachings of John MacArthur for uh, uh, the material in the Gospel of Mark. Uh, but uh, in verses 11 through 13 uh, of our text, you see this permanent spiritual blindness. And then in the middle of verse 13, on down to verse 21, you see temporary blindness. First of all, I want for you to look at with me 
uh, this natural blindness. A natural blindness, and that's on your outline, by the way, if you're filling in the blank, and that we are naturally blinded. I mentioned last week that everyone born into this world is born into darkness, born in spiritual blindness, if you will. Everyone born into the world by virtue of being human uh, comes uh, this, this, this blindness, okay? And uh, everyone born, uh, that virtue is, it comes with sin, uh, and, and basically what I'm talking about is a sin nature that we inherited uh, from Adam. That's what I want you to hear. We inherited a sin nature. Now, I'm not talking about original sin here. I'm just talking about a sin nature. We are not born sinners, by the way, and uh, that's one reason why we don't baptize babies here uh, because they have nothing to be forgiven for. I mean, they've not sinned. Uh, we are not born sinners, but we are born with a desire to sin a propensity toward uh, sin and darkness. And of course, uh, Genesis is very clear that we inherited that uh, from Adam. Now, if you turn with me, please, to 1 Corinthians uh, chapter 2, verse 14. 1 Corinthians chapter 2, verse 14, back after uh, Acts and Romans. Paul's letter to the church at Corinth. And if you're there in the second chapter, of uh, 1 Corinthians. And by the way, you might want to put a little marker there, tear off a piece of paper or something. Uh, we'll come back to uh, 1 Corinthians here in a little bit or 2 Corinthians, one or the other. But um, when we read here in verse 14 of, of 2 Cor 1 Corinthians chapter 2, uh, the text says, the man without the spirit, okay, the man without the spirit, and of course you all know enough to know when we receive the Holy Spirit. We receive the Holy Spirit when we are baptized, we're raised to a newness of life, we receive the gift of the Holy Spirit. But Paul writes here to the church of Corinth, a man without the Spirit does not accept the things that come from the Spirit of God. So that's the darkness, if you will, for they are foolishness to him, and he cannot understand them because they are spiritually discerned. So it's the Holy Spirit that guides us through God's Word, the Scripture, as God reveals himself to us. And he has done that from Genesis all the way through uh, to Revelation. Uh, so every human being comes into the world blind in the darkness by virtue of just being human. Now, again, this is not what some denominations refer to as original sin. We're not talking about that at all. Again, original sin says that we are born sinners and we are not. Uh, we're not born sinners. As I stated before, we have inherited from Adam that desire to sin. And at some point, we do sin, each and every one of us. Romans chapter 3, verse 23 talks about uh, being sinfully blinded. Sinfully blinded. That's on your outside, uh, outline as well. So Romans 3, 23, for all have sinned and fall short of the glory of God. So we all fall uh, to sin, each and every one of us. Now, please turn with me to the Gospel of John chapter 3. Matthew, Mark, and then John chapter 3, if you would, please. That fact that sin compounds the blindness, that's what we're talking about here. Uh, John chapter 3, uh, beginning in verse 19, this is the verdict, John writes, light has come into the world, but men loved darkness instead of light because their deeds were evil. Look with me at verse 20. Everyone who does evil hates the light, and will not come into the light for fear that his deeds will be exposed. So you see, we are all uh, sinners, saved by grace, by the way, but we, so we're naturally uh, sin, sinners, we're sinfully uh, sin, and uh, sa satanically uh, blinded. And I want you to look at that with me. Let's go back here now to 2 Corinthians. I promised you we'd be in that area again. So 2 Corinthians chapter 4, verse 4. Okay, the Apostle Paul writes, the God of this age, okay, who's the God of this age? Anybody know? Satan, Satan right. Uh, has blinded the minds of unbelievers so that they cannot see the light of the gospel of the glory of Christ, who is the image of God. 
So man is naturally blinded, we are sinfully blinded, and then we are satanically blinded. Uh, there is this profound blindness that engulfs the souls of all human beings. And so Satan does actually put blinders on us. Uh, he can also become, uh, we can also become sovereign uh, blindness. Uh, now, there are illustrations of this in the ministry of the Lord Jesus Christ. If you go with me to Luke chapter 19, we're doing a little bit of Bible study here this morning, so I love to hear those pages turn. Uh, Luke chapter 19. It's important where, that we learn, and we learn in the process of turning to all these, uh, all the scripture. Luke 19, beginning in verse uh, 41. Verse 41 of Luke 19. And this uh, talks about the triumphal entry. You all are familiar with uh, Jesus when he, uh, right before his crucifixion, he rode the donkey into uh, Jerusalem. And so we pick up here in verse uh, 41. As he approached Jerusalem and saw the city, he wept over it. He wept over it. Jesus wept over the city. Why? If you, even you, he said, had only known on this day what would bring you peace, but now it is hidden from your eyes. The days will come upon you when your enemies will build an embankment against you and encircle you and hem you in on every side. So that's what we're talking about, sovereign uh, blindness, sovereign blindness. If we remain hard-hearted without turning to Christ, eventually we could be blinded uh, forever, blinded forever. And so there are illustrations of this, again, all throughout the scripture. Uh, Jesus basically said to the Jews that gathered there that day, as Jesus' triumphant entry, he said, no more, no more, it's over for you. Uh, you ignored the day of your heavenly visitation, and now you have no other opportunity. And they were confirmed, if you will, in their darkness. That's on your outline. They were confirmed in their darkness. So that leads us to this fifth kind of blindness, and, and we don't want to face this because this is an eternal blindness, eternal blindness. We want to get over this before we get here. But hell is this outer darkness. The Bible is very specific about hell. Hell is very real. We all come into the world blind, but we all don't have to leave the world blind. That's what's important, and that's the message that we have even today, is that we do not have to leave this world blind. Some of us come to see, some of us, by the grace of God, are delivered by our choice to accept Jesus Christ into our heart and soul, and we are delivered out of the kingdom of darkness into the kingdom of God's dear Son. So some of us come to the light of the world, and Jesus, in whom all darkness is dispelled. So when we accept Jesus Christ, all that darkness, uh, at least in our mind, uh, we begin that process of sanctification that we become righteous before God because of the fact that we've accepted uh, Jesus Christ as our Lord and accepted God's plan for our lives. And so that basically means we start doing things the way of God. And just like uh, Callie saying this morning, is that there are various many ways that we can praise our Lord. Various and many ways we can praise our Lord. So some of us who were in darkness have now become light. And, and some of us walk in the light. And we're, we were all blind, uh, some permanently by choice and the love of sin in our lives, but then some of us temporarily. And by this time, uh, in Mark's gospel, by the time we come to this point uh, in our text, it's been over two years that Jesus has been ministering openly, publicly, and doing miracles that are literally unable to count. As a matter of fact, you may remember in the Gospel of John, it ends with the statement that everything, if we had written down everything he did, it could not be contained in all the books uh, of the world. And that's, that's amazing. That's an amazing statement to me. Um, his miracles were public, open, they were undeniable. Even Nicodemus, the teacher of the Jews said, we know you come from God because no one can do works you do except God be with him except God be with them. But no matter how brightly the light was shining, sinners loved the darkness. They loved the darkness. And when the light came, like bugs scrambling back under a rock, uh, 
The sinner dives deeper into the darkness to avoid the light. And so the light came, but they did not comprehend the light. And that's in the first chapter of John, by the way, the Gospel of John, if you'd like to review that. So the leaders of Israel loved the darkness. They hated the light. Uh, the people who followed them were, were in the same category. Uh, the leaders of Israel and the people who followed them were devoted to the delusion of self-righteousness, uh, the delusion of uh, ritualistic, uh, ceremonial, uh, legalistic religion. Uh, but on the other hand, there was a small group of men and women who saw the light and they followed the light. They're known as disciples, that is, followers of Jesus Christ. And I think most of us here this morning are exactly that. And uh, I'm not even going to begin to point out who might be and who might not be, other than the fact that we can tell by our fruits whether we belong to Christ or not. And if I were to start picking out what I think, I'd get it all wrong anyway. And that's why God didn't put me here for that purpose. I'm not God. I don't judge. That's up to God. Now, I, I discern. I discern a little bit, but that's another sermon for another time. But the word translated disciple... Uh, in the original language of the Bible is the word methetes, and I put that on your uh, bulletin. Methetes means learners, it means learners. And you might remember that just by the word math uh, that's in that uh, Greek spelling. And so as disciples, they turned their back on, on the darkness, they followed the light, and this is the crucial point here in the ministry of Jesus Gal in Galilee, because it is here that the leaders of Israel, on behalf of the nation, make their final verdict that Jesus is not their Messiah, he's not their Savior, and they reject him finally. And according to verse 13, uh, it, the scripture right here in our text says that uh, leaving them, leaving them, do you see that? Please turn with me to Mark chapter 8 if you don't have a mark. Um, mark chapter 8 and verse 13 Then he left them, got back into the boat, and crossed to the other side. The Pharisees were giving him a hard time, and so he left them. And he took the disciples with him in his boat, and there could have been other boats uh, that followed. Uh, but according to verse 13, when he says, leaving them, you can see that metaphorically as well. Not only did he leave them physically on the northwestern shore of Galilee, but he abandoned them in the sense of Romans chapter 1, that says they gave, uh, God gave them over to their darkness and their own unbelief. And so it's not the first time that God has done that. You know, God puts up with us for so long. His grace is greater than our greatest sin, but at the same time, he's a patient God too, by the way. So just don't find yourself there turning your back on God time and time and time again. Uh, the question then was, who would follow Jesus here when Jesus took his disciples in the boat, because whoever followed Jesus would be turning his back on, on the religion of their ancestors, the religion of their nation, the religion of their past, you know, because we're following what grandma and grandpa did for years. It may or may not be right, depending on what denomination it is. And so we have decisions that we need to make on our own. Uh, so many today follow the religion of their ancestors, uh, though there is not much of a relationship with Christ. So those who went with Jesus followed the light. Jesus is the light. Spiritual blindness for them was only temporary. Uh, the leaders of Israel, the nation that followed them, followed them into a permanent blindness, into judicial blindness, judgment, and into other darkness. Last week, I gave you three features of these type of people, those that are uh, blind permanently. One, they were comfortable with others in the darkness. They were comfort with others that were in darkness, even though they, they might have been their enemies, but they came together in hating Christ and hating Christianity, and, and they were comfortable with that. Uh, the second thing is those who were permanently, and these aren't on your outline, by the way, I, I don't believe, we're going to get there in, here in a little bit as to uh, the same type of attributes that we have as uh, being temporarily blinded. But those who are permanently blind are not only comfortable with others in the darkness, but they, they're consigned to a greater darkness. In other words, you start sinning and it just builds and it builds and it builds. And that's what I was talking about as far as turning your back on Christ, on the Holy Spirit. Uh, that's blasphemy and it's being apostate. And finally, they're, they're condemned to permanent darkness, the outer darkness of hell. Uh, 
Now, the second part of verse 13 through 21, uh, we're going to look at temporary blindness. Now, we're going to move from those people who hardened against the Lord to those who followed him, the light of the world. Verse 13 says, then he left them, got back into the boat, crossed over to the other side. That is, he got back into the little boat, which transfer, uh, traversed the northern part of the Sea of Galilee. And it seems like uh, during this time in our studies that they're just going from back and forth, from uh, Capernaum area uh, on over to the eastern side, which, by the way, were mostly Gentile. And so it was kind of back and forth, back and forth. And if, if you've been here and listening to this, you, you know that they just uh, did that quite a bit here in the book of Mark. But they've been doing that a lot. And uh, after this, in a symbolic gesture, the Lord leaves, and then he left them, and the light goes, and it's gone. And he takes all his followers who have seen the light, embraced the light, and are following the light with him, and they came across to the northwest now, and they go back to the northeast. So they, they were once blind. They were once blind. They were as blind as uh, the rejectors because they were part of a religion of Judaism, apostate, fallen, uh, Judaism spread uh, by the Pharisees, and you know they were a self-righteous bunch, okay? They were as blind as they were, but now they have come to see the light and their eyes are being opened. You know, the light has shined, they have understood the light, and the light is increasingly bright. It gets brighter and brighter. The more we learn of Christ, the more we take on the mind of Christ, the brighter that light uh, becomes. Does that make sense, amen? Amen. Okay. Uh, they have cursed the darkness of sin, and they have sought to walk in the light. So there is a song written, by the way, of uh, Ellie Holcomb. I don't know if you've heard it or not. Uh, she performed it a few short years ago right here in Shelbyville, by the way. And I'd like to share a few words of her song. And she wrote, writes and sings, I am not who I once was, defined by all things that I've done. Afraid my shame would be exposed, afraid of really being known. But then you gave me a heart, a home, with years of keeping secrets safe, wondering if I could change. Because when you're hiding all alone, your heart can turn into a stone. And that's not the way that I want to go. So she sings, I walked out of the darkness and into the light, from fear of shame into the hope of life. Mercy called my name and made a way to fly out of the darkness and into the light. Those are such cool words. You know, that's what God has done for us. He's moved us out of the darkness and into the light. There's no place that I would rather be, she sings. Your light is marvelous. Your light is marvelous. You see, the disciples, they understood the cost of what it was that they were doing. They've forsaken all. Uh, they, they will be thrown out of the synagogue. They will be... Uh, dispose, dispose us from family and friends. They are going to follow the light. The Lord is the light. The Lord is their teacher. He gets in the boat and they get in as well. And there may have been, again, several other boats following. So our Lord takes his disciples back again by boat across the lake. And uh, the rejection of the leaders of Israel is final. And it's the last time our Lord publicly ministers in Galilee. Now, if you go to uh, chapter 9, at verse 30, we see that Jesus does end up in uh, Galilee again. I'm not going to read from there, uh, but you can make note of that. Uh, so there will be a, a slight ministry in Galilee one more time. Uh, actually, the scripture does say he began to go through Galilee, but he didn't want anyone to know about it. Why? Because, once again, this was another teaching time for his disciples. The ministry there in Galilee, as far as others were concerned, was pretty much over. So this is a, a cutoff point. They're fixed in their darkness. This is a monumental moment in the history of our Lord's ministry. You would have thought that the disciples would have said, Lord, wow, I mean, this, this is dramatic. Could you tell us about this? Can you tell us what all this means? But that was not on their minds. Look with me at verse 14 of our text, and we'll see what's on their mind, okay? The disciples had forgotten to bring bread. <laughs> I just can't believe it. I can't help but laugh when I read that. Except for one loaf they had with them in the boat, 
Be careful, Jesus warned them. Watch out for the yeast of the Pharisees and that of Herod. Watch out for the yeast of the Pharisees. Now, they had forgotten to take bread, didn't have more than a loaf in, at best with them. They were thinking about what? They wasn't thinking about all this stuff that was going on that was just fantastic. But what they were thinking about was lunch. They were hungry. So whatever light they had seen, it must not have been a whole lot of light, okay? They're just beginning to grow. And this basic struggle for food is a part of the primitive world. Uh, we understand that. But to be preoccupied with lunch when there's a massive issues going on in faith and rejection, it just seems pretty short-sighted uh, to me. So for, for whatever light they do see, whatever light there is shining, uh, there's a lot of blindness that is left in these disciples. But let's look a little bit more at them and let's pick up the positive things that we can see from uh, moving from permanent to temporary, okay? If you're in the light, uh, you're comfortable with the light. That's just opposite of those who are in um, permanent darkness. The people in the darkness were comfortable with the darkness. These are comfortable with the light. His disciples are comfortable with the light. Uh, they leave the blind Pharisees and Sadducees and the religious system behind, and they're following the rejected Lord. Everybody else rejected. The one they know now to be the light of the world. They leave the enemies of truth, and that's important for us today. Uh, we have enemies of truth, but they begin to leave that, leave that behind, and that's the first thing that marks a, pe a people of light, you and me. And that is that we run to the light, the light of holiness and the light of truth. That's where our hearts should be. Now, Jesus speaks to them about a few important issues if you're going to sustain the strength of this commitment. It's a big break. This uh, is a very big break. They've turned their backs on the entire society, and they seem to be aware that they're in danger. And so our Lord says to them here in verse 15, Mark chapter 8, I've had you all over the place, so I'll keep you focused here. Be careful, Jesus warned. Watch out for the yeast of the Pharisees and that of Herod. You know, this was uh, actually written in an imperfect tense in the original language. And so what that means is Jesus kept, kept on warning them. He repeatedly warned them, watch out for the Pharisees. Watch out for the Pharisees. Be careful. Watch out for the yeast of the Pharisees and the yeast of Herod. Uh, a double warning. Uh, present imperatives, do this. Intense, severe warning against the influence of the Pharisees and against the influence of Herod. We've got to be careful who we hang with, you know, unless we know that we're stronger than they are and we can introduce them to Christ. But if they're going to influence our lives, then, then we must be very careful and, and build ourselves up uh, through spiritual armor that we might be prepared to go back then and, and share the gospel message. The uh, Pharisees were the legalists, Herodians were the secularists, those who just followed society, evil. Be, beware, watch out, Jesus said, I, I'm warning you. You know, that is so foundational. Uh, beware of the present, ever-present influences of legalism, liberalism, and secularism, those who love sin. Um, you know, yeast is a biblical illustration of permeation, influence, in other words. Yeast makes dough rise by bacterial corruption. Now, does it make, that make your dinner roll sound good for this afternoon at lunchtime? But this is what Jesus is talking about. You need to be warned that you're still going to be surrounded by the Pharisaic religion. You're still going to be surrounded by the Sadducean liberalism. You're still going to be surrounded by the influences of Herod, uh, Herodian secularism and all that is evil. Evil is all around us, my friends, and we just simply need to be aware. They all rejected Christ, the Pharisees, the Sadducees, the Herodians, and they all came together, even though they were enemies of each other, against him, against Jesus Christ. So Jesus, he's urging a full break from evil because of all those things that have influenced them. You know, our students in college, by the way, parents, give you something else to worry about need to be extremely aware of what is being taught and just caution your kids. 
uh, warn them if necessary. Professors will often want to indoctrinate our adult kids into liberal theology and uh, we're to just run from that and leave it behind because these influences are still very dangerous. That is the work of Satan. It's not the work of God. Warn your kids to hold on to the truth of God's word. And if they need help, have them contact a, a good, strong Christian a friend uh, to be with them and to help them out. You know, Jesus is the model educator, no doubt. He's the protector of his students. He will teach them. He will uh, protect, protect them. Look with me at verse 16 of our text as we work our way through this passage. They discussed this with one another and said, it's because we have no bread. So, you know, they got to discussing. I mean, what's Jesus all about? He gets to talking about the Pharisees and the yeast and everything. Not even talking about lunch. You know, we're ready to talk about lunch. But that's not the kind of bread that uh, Jesus was talk talking about here at the moment. Um, you know, they could have asked me uh, lots of questions given what Jesus said in verse 15. You know, they might have said, how can I recognize the yeast? How do I know when I'm succumbing to uh, the sin, the yeast, how do I avoid it? What do I do to insulate myself against it? What are I going to do to provide an alternative? I mean, there are a, a hundred questions one could ask and they're looking at each other and saying, what are we gonna do for lunch? They were a hungry bunch. So is it any wonder if you question the patience of Jesus, um, you don't know this, how patient was he with them? Some spiritual blindness definitely remains. They were comfortable with the light. They loved being with Jesus and being with others who wanted them to be with Jesus, but they were in need of more light. And that's the second point that I want to give you, number two, unless you've lost that already on your outline. But they were conducted to greater light. They found the light, and then they were conducted to greater light. Again, you can call this sanctification or whatever you want, being made holy, uh, if you will. They miss the entire meaning of the warning. They're thinking he's wanting them to make sure they don't eat leavened bread, uh, stick with flat bread, but that's not what he's talking about. In the goodness of the Lord, they are conducted to a greater light. And remember the Pharisees and the Sadducees had said, show us a sign, show us a sign, give, give us more light. Jesus said, man, I've been with you. I've been with you, you've been hearing my messages. Why do you need yet another sign. Look at all these miracles I have performed. Look at all this healing, and you're telling me, give us a sign? The people who were permanently in the darkness are comfortable with the darkness. They're only going to experience more darkness, and they're going to be condemned to everlasting darkness. But those who are in the light, they're comfortable with the light. They will be conducted into greater light. And the Lord shows his patience here. And in verse 17, uh, Jesus is aware of this, and so let's take, just take a look at that. 17, aware of their discussion. Gee, I wonder how Jesus knew. <laughs> Jesus asked them, why are you talking about having no bread? Do you still not see or understand? Are your hearts hardened? Do you not have eyes, but fail, do you have eyes but fail to see and ears but fail to hear? And don't you remember when I broke the five loaves for the 5,000 and many basketfuls of pieces did you pick up? 12, they replied. And when I broke the seven loaves for the 4,000, how many basketfuls of pieces did you pick up? And they answered, seven. And he said to them, do you still not understand? Do you still not understand, Jesus said. Isn't it astonishing that at this present moment, in the stress of this present moment, we forget often ourselves the fulfillment of God's care for us in the past. We, t we tend to just forget it or not bring it to mind. Why in the world are you thinking about that when you ought to think about the dangerous things that are going to influence your very soul? He's gentle with this, Jesus is, and he says, do you not yet understand? As I say, what more is it that I need to do? You know, in Matthew chapter uh, 16, we looked at this, I think, last week briefly. But then they understood. This is the parallel passage to what we're reading right now. Because Jesus was asking a lot of rhetorical questions in our passage. But then Matthew comes along on this same account here. And he said, then they understood that he was not telling them to guard against the yeast used in bread, but against the teaching of the Pharisees and the Sadducees. In other words, Matthew is saying, 
They understand Jesus. <laughs> they get it. It may take them a moment, but they get it. Sometimes all you need to understand in the moment is the past. Regardless of your guilt, your shame, or, or your wrongs, all you need is to understand the present is the past. You just need to understand, learn, just learn. The past is the best indicator of how to view the present. If God has been faithful in the past, he'll be faithful again in the future, and I know he's been faithful in the past. You know, in the Sermon on the Mount, Matthew chapter 6, which would include 5, 6, and 7. But Matthew chapter 6, verse 33, Jesus said, Don't take any thought for what you shall eat or drink, but seek the kingdom, and I'll take care of the rest. He'll take care of the rest. He takes care of us. You see, Matthew is very explicit in his parallel account in Matthew 16 and 12. They understood, he said, and the rest, then they understood that he didn't say to beware of the leaven of bread, but of the Pharisees and the Sadducees. Wow. You know, Jesus is, is a discipler. He, he's a teacher. And he just moves them along to greater light. And those who follow the light are comfortable with the light, and they are conducted into a greater light. But I want to give you the third one very quickly here. And that is, they're a permanent companion with the light. We become a permanent companion with the light. You know, Jesus' followers stay with him through Galilee, and they stay with him all the way to the end. And some of them are gathered in Galilee when he makes a post-resurrection appearance, 500 of them eyewitnesses, and they will be in the fellowship of the light forever. Jesus is the light of heaven. Is he not? That's the question I have for you this morning. Are you light? Are you in the light? Are you in the light of Jesus? Have you accepted him as your Lord and Savior to bring on the, the Holy Spirit in your life so you can live the life that God wants for you to live? You know, everybody's blind, either forever or temporarily. The gospel offers light to the blind, like the light of truth the light of holiness and virtue through Christ Jesus our Lord. He is alone in the light, and whoever follows him will not walk in darkness. I'm going to ask the praise team to make their way forward, if they would, please. And, but while they're doing that, just don't pay any attention to them, because I'd like for you to just bow your head in prayer with me, if you would, please. Father God, we thank you for this wonderful morning. And what a delight it has been to fellowship, to sing, to worship, to pray, to get into your word. But Lord, in the end, what matters is that we be in the light, that we be children of the light and not walk in darkness. For those of us who are in the light, there in us no darkness. Lord, how grateful we are that you have delivered us from the kingdom of darkness into the realm of Christ Jesus. We thank you that as we follow the light, it grows brighter and brighter and brighter as we are sanctified and as we are led to the greater and greater understanding. We will follow the light until we stand in the blazing glory of that light and in your presence in heaven. Father, we pray that if there is someone here who's not accepted Jesus Christ, that, Father, you would touch them in a very special way that would cause them to want to make that decision even this morning. And we pray it all in Christ's name. Amen.